welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buchholz, and this is episode 227, An Agent's Perspective, an interview with Julie Gwynn, coming to you on Thursday, December 17th, 2020. So on Thursday, if you're listening to this on the day, one more day till vacation. <laughs> is anyone just jonesing for vacation like I am? I've been I haven't been counting down the days, but kind of all week, I've just been like, I've got to finish working. I've got to just do some more work. I only have five more days, four more days, and now one more day until Christmas vacation. I'm excited. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're just totally ready for a vacation, especially when it's one that you know for sure is coming and mine will be two weeks long. Yay! totally excited. I'm also going to be doing a lot of writing during vacation, so that'll also be fun, but um, I'm also going to be watching a lot of movies, a lot of great stuff coming out on Disney Plus and Netflix and HBO and yeah, plan on baking a lot. <laughs> Can I assume you're probably going to be baking or cooking or you know, at least buying something really good from a restaurant or something, getting some good takeout? Ah, oh, vacation. So Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays. Whatever it is that you are celebrating, I hope that you have a wonderful and safe time. That is my plan as well. And um, I have to say, I'm, I'm really... I'm really ready for it. I'm ready to have happy thoughts and happy holidays and kind of put the year put the year to bed in a calm, relaxing, happy way. And that's what I wish for you as well. I also hope that if you want to, you are going to get maybe some writing done during vacation. Maybe that's going to be your best time to do it. And that you're really beginning to look forward to next year and all the different kinds of writing that you could be doing. Um, the plans that you have, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, big things or small things, short things, uh, something that just really makes your heart sing and makes you feel happy when you think about it. And where even all of the work that it takes to write something and then, you know, rewrite it and polish it and make it really good that all of it actually sounds super duper good. <laughs> That's my favorite part. My favorite part of life, I think, is probably writing and coming up with the story and wrestling with it. I, I like I might like all the parts of writing, honestly, <laughs> not always in the moment, but in general. And listen, if you've been listening to me over the last few weeks or months or years, and you've been thinking, you know what, maybe I would want to talk to Kitty about being uh, one of her book coaching clients, reach out to me. I am having a great time. Um, I I always knew I liked doing this, but I didn't realize how much I loved doing it until I got really serious about it and had actual programs and, and clients. And, um, so reach out to me at rightnowworkshop.com forward slash writing coach, and let me know that you're curious about, uh, working together, um, either one-on-one -on -one or in a small group coaching program, which would be less than 10 people. And we would meet on zoom calls. Um, all of it would be on zoom calls because then uh, pandemic or no, uh, that we still aren't all in the same place. So, uh, that's the best way we can communicate better, see each other's facial expressions and body language. And it's just, um, if you can't meet together, then I think being on video is definitely the, the better part rather than audio only. Um, and then um, keep in mind too, that I've got a uh, membership group that is pretty much all about the accountability of writing together. And we do two or three writing sprints a week and we have a guest speaker once a month. And um, it's just people get together in the Zoom room get everybody there. All right. 30 minutes from now, go. Everybody mutes. Type, 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 type. And sometimes, you know, uh, somebody will be working on something that's not the actual typing of the project. Maybe it's, this is my half an hour. I'm going to spend only a half an hour doing this particular research or, um, you know, coming up with the backstory, but it's nice because you have a start time and a stop time. And then you can see what did I get done? And then we can all celebrate each other and encourage each other. So it's a great group. Uh, you can do that for just uh, $105 for three months and it's super fun. And the people are really, really, really nice. So um, if you're interested in that, let me know or go to the website 
And then last message, yes, I wanted to remind you that um, I have really been enjoying this mini season that I've been doing on the podcast where I have five episodes that are all about this one topic of editing. So if you are coming in new and you didn't know that, all five of the December episodes are all about editing. So definitely you're going to want to listen to all of them, definitely. Um, And they come from the perspective of editors, agents, Um, And then one is um, last week was an agent and a debut author talking together. So that's pretty cool. Um, Lots of really good advice and interesting ways to be thinking about editing your book. So I hope that you've been enjoying that. Um, I also have. And so I'm going to start changing the the way that I do the episodes so that it is always in seasons. So uh, December 31st will be the end of our uh, five, five episode mini season on editing and then there'll be three weeks off and the next season will start on January 28th. So if you are not subscribed and you're listening to this um, either on your podcast app or on YouTube, just be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you don't forget to come back again um, at the end of the uh, the three off weeks. Um, otherwise, let me know if there's something interesting that you want to hear people talk about or a guest that you want to see whether or not I can get on the show. I'm happy to try to get who Whoever, or at least try to get whoever that you're interested in. I was actually um, looking up somebody today uh, who is a singer songwriter and thinking, oh, I don't know that I've had anybody on talking about songwriting and he's somebody that I, I just really like all of the songs that he's written. So, so uh, yeah, let me know what you're interested in. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you to those of you who have written me an email or left a message on any of the YouTube videos. I don't always see these things on the day that you do it, but I so, so, so appreciate them. Some of you have just said the nicest, loveliest things, and I'm so glad that you're getting value and, um, and, and that you just feel good listening to the podcast. I want you to get both of those things. So I know at least some of you are, yay, (laughs) you're my people. Um, I think that that is all I have got right now. So, um, In the meantime, I definitely want you to be thinking about all the happy things and happy thoughts that you can do with your vacation time, even if it's not the the normal way that you would normally be spending the next couple of weeks. I hope that you will choose to find um, good, peaceful parts of it and, and choose to be happy. There's a lot of things in life that we can't control, but for the most part, we can control uh, how we choose to feel about something and, and move ourselves more in a direction that's positive or more in a direction that's negative. And sometimes it's hard and sometimes you feel like you can't. And I totally get that. If you're listening, going, don't tell me to feel positive. I'm not feeling very positive at all. Totally get that. Hang in there. You will feel better again. (laughs) And hopefully listening to the show and listening to all of us talk about happy writing things. Um, it's going to also cheer you up if you needed it. So that's all I've got for you in the way of announcements and news. Here is Julie. She's lovely. I just love her. And she's going to give you some great information about an agent's perspective on editing. So here's Julie. Today's guest is Julie Gwynn. Currently a literary agent with the Seymour Agency, Julie has more than a decade in publishing, including serving as marketing manager, then fiction publisher for BNH Publishing Group and marketing manager for Abington Press. Prior to joining the publishing industry, Julie has more than 25 years experience in advertising, marketing, and public relations. She uses her previous experience to aid her authors at every phase of their publishing plan. She lives in Nashville, Tennessee with her husband and two children and also enjoys freelance editing and do-it-yourself projects around the house. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much, Kitty, for having me. I'm excited. Yay! I've been excited to talk to you since the first time that I met you and we were talking. You were on a mountaintop with a cell phone. and. (laughs) That's kind of the way you do things in Tennessee. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, it's great to see your smiling face. I've seen your picture, but now I'm like, oh, this is what she looks like in real life. (laughs) Yeah, it's always better to put a face with a name, I I think. Yeah, and you know what? I've been thinking for over a year, I really need new headshots. I finally let my... I was born with brown hair, but now I have my mother's white hair. <laughs> oh, 
And I really need new headshots because my old ones like show a totally different look with brown hair. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, COVID has been like, yeah, no, I, I'm just going to have to give people my old headshot. <laughs> I know. It's like, don't look too close. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, so I'm very excited to have you on the show because you and I have already talked. I know that you give amazing advice, so I'm super excited. Um, this episode, you and I are talking in, in November, but this is going to be part of my December editing series. So I've got uh, you and another agent and three other editors, and I really want people to be thinking about editing. Not only, um, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are writing like mad during National Novel Writing month right now. But then there's the, what do I do with it? Or even if you didn't do nano, uh, how do I make this into a book that somebody might want to buy and publish for me, or maybe I'll publish it myself. But, but there's a lot in between. I finished my first draft and I have a book ready to publish. So I thought you could give us kind of an agent's perspective. Absolutely. Um, you're right. There is a whole lot of stuff that happens between um, the end <laughs> and seeing it on a bookshelf, whether it's self-pub or traditional publishing. And um, if they have finished a book, I say congratulations. To be honest with you, um, a lot, about 10 years ago in publishing, we could submit to editors with the proposal in the first three chapters. And publishers found out that sometimes folks can't finish, life happens. Oh, you know, yeah. writer's block happens. And so they acquired something that ends up either not panning out or not being as good as they thought. So right now the publishing industry has shifted and so have agents to where we really only take a look at full manuscripts. So anybody who's gone through NaNoWriMo and has a completed manuscript, you are the lion's share ahead of the rest of the crowd. Seriously, because really? you've got it done. You finished a book. Great. Yeah. And I think that people like me who um, I, I have finished a book more than once, and it's hard for me to remember back in that huge long period of time where I'd been writing, 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 and still have never actually finished one book. I would just go on to the next project if I got right. stuck. But it's it's good to remember, especially people, if you are listening right now and you just finished your first book or you finished your 40th book and it was maybe harder than one of the other 39, like seriously congratulate yourself and celebrate the fact that you did it again, something that other people want to do and just haven't been able to. Exactly. And, you know, I have a phrase button chair, you know, yeah. BIC when authors are like, oh, what do I need to do? You need to sit, you need to focus and you need to get it done because we really can't evaluate it. We can't sell it. We can't edit it. We can't work on it unless it's full. And unless right. it's complete. And so getting to that point is tiresome, sometimes frustrating. Um, but that is a huge first step that a lot of folks don't get to, you know, yeah. they peter out or whatever. So you're exactly right. Congratulate yourselves. If you have a full manuscript, whatever shape it's in, <laughs> um, that's a huge first step. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, why don't you give us just a little bit of background on you so that we can understand like, what is it to be an agent and um, how do agents even know what to tell us to do? And then let's um, kind of move through agenting a little bit. And um, our primary topic today is going to be about book proposals, because mm -hmm. I think that maybe people don't totally understand um, when and how to do book proposals. Right. So my background is mostly, I have a journalism degree. Uh, and did the PR newspaper reporter route for a while nice. and then went into um, marketing for Lifeway Christian Resources. So I was ah. hired as their marketing manager and I was teamed up with Karen Ball, who oh, I is, know her. <laughs> yes, who's kind of a legend in uh, publishing, especially inspirational publishing. She's also an author. Um, and because she was in Oregon, I was in Nashville where the headquarters is, she would task me with looking through proposals and say, you can only send me three. Or I would go to you know conferences on her behalf and she would say, okay, you can only send me two. So from a marketing perspective, I'm thinking I can sell any of these. You know, <laughs> they're all great. They all have a wonderful hook. But from an editorial perspective and knowing what it's going to take to get it through the internal channels 
and then published and then sell through to the consumer, you have to be more discerning. And so it was wonderful being able to learn that through her uh, because now as an agent, you know, I'm getting 20 emails a day, you know, we're going to virtual conferences now and I love them all. I, you know, they're like puppies. I wish I could keep them all because I think they're all wonderful. Um, but there's the logistics of bandwidth for me and also the reality of publishing spots that are available. So it kind of forces me to have to hone down. I still use the marketing background a lot. Once I've signed an author, I work with them to really get their platform up and going and built because getting that first contract as hard as it is, is important that we do well, or there may not be a subsequent contract, Right. you know? So getting that sell through, making sure the numbers are great. And so much is being put on authors right now to market their books. So I think that's probably what makes me different as an agent is that I've got that marketing background and I kind of help them long-term you know, I'm not done when the contract is signed. I actually work with them through release, you know, reposting and helping to make sure that um, they're reaching their target audience. Yeah. And you understand being on, uh, well, <laughs> we're going to make this a three-sided desk now instead of two-sided. Not only are you an agent now, but you used to be an acquisitions editor, right? And you've been a writer. Correct. So Karen, um, because of the distance situation, uh, stepped back and I became fiction publisher for B&H. We had about 24 books that we put out a year. We had our first Christie Award winner with Ginny Weitrip's book, Words. Yes. She's an incredible writer. Uh, we had Brandilyn Collins. We had Tosca Lee and Jim Rubart. So we had a lot of really strong folks. And then Lifeway just made the decision not to do fiction anymore. And at that time, um, several inspirational publishers kind of stepped back from fiction and really started focusing more on church leadership and nonfiction. So that's when I moved into agenting. But I feel like everything I've done has culminated to this point because I use every skill set, time management, knowing the production process, uh, knowing what makes a good cover, advocating for authors, you know, contracts, I've seen both sides now, the yeah. editing, the marketing, all of it is kind of rolled up into what I'm doing now. Nice. And I would say that just um, being you, this would be kind of an awesome job. Like you have all sorts of different skills and you get to use them all. Exactly. I, I seriously love my job. And, you know, there's the thrill of the hunt, you know, yeah. looking through the, the email inbox, um, looking for that gem. Um, all the way through to today, I got a text that one of my Amish authors made the USA Today bestseller list. So, you know, it's, it, it's lovely seeing the process start to finish yeah. instead of just a piece of it, like I did when I was publisher right. um, or marketing manager, you know, where you're just getting inserted at a certain point. Right now I get to see start to finish and I love it. Yeah, yeah. So let's look at um, the publishing industry. Like, honestly, I think every industry in the world, whether it does it slowly or quickly, um, it changes over time. It changes with um, with new technology or uh, just all sorts of different things. So the publishing industry is no different. Um, it, there was a point when I started when there was traditional publishing or there was save up a few thousand dollars, go to a printer, make a space in your garage and try selling the books out of the trunk of your car. <laughs> and then things started developing, developing. And now in the 21st century, there's so much technology. There's a ton of things that both traditional and independent publishers can do. So um, I'm not really sure like where you want to come into the conversation on this, but one of the things that you and I decided we were going to talk about book proposals. So, um, but that also is like, but, uh, if I don't need a book proposal, if I'm not going to the tr- traditional route, uh, how do I know what I want and how do I know if I need or want an agent? Do you want to talk about agenting and, and the author relationship a little bit? How sure, somebody decides? absolutely. And, you know, you, you hit a very important part, Kitty, that is the industry is changing. 
you know, I have seen authors who at that very early stage with some of the smaller boutique publishers have gotten locked into contracts where they uh, um, forfeited their rights to their book uh-huh. in perpetuity, like forever. So, uh-huh. you know, I've seen some really bad contracts and I've seen some bad things happen where authors are being taken advantage of by agents who charge or publishers who charge a lot. Um, So where an agent helps is to, even if you want to go the self-publishing route, I have several of my authors that are hybrid. And so we have projects that I'm shopping to traditional publishers, but then I'm also there as a guide if they get into a mess or have a contract or need help or need marketing support for their self-published work. Yeah. So I feel like an agent, we don't get paid until the author gets paid. And just having somebody to look at your proposal, look at your work, whether you're going traditional or self-publishing, editing your work so that what you put out there through self-publishing doesn't maybe hurt your chances later on down the line. Right. for a traditional contract. You know, I've seen some folks just putting stuff up that's not edited, putting covers up that aren't great. Um, and, and that reflects, Yeah, you know, you see that in the reviews and then they come to an agent and say, okay, now I want to traditionally publish. And unfortunately you, you can't erase yeah. what's already been done and a publisher will look at that. So where an agent comes in is we can help with the career planning and say, okay, if you want to self-publish now, with this project and maybe traditional publish with this one, let's figure out a strategy, you know, let, let me help you so that what goes out there elevates your author brand instead of is something that you have to find explanations for, you know, down the line. Right. So we're kind of, um, we know where the traps are. We help authors navigate that and keep from falling into that. Um, but we also just want the best product out there that can be yeah and sometimes that means taking a step back and getting a professional editor getting a professional cover designer things like that but at least we're industry professionals and can kind of help guide and counsel authors in in those decisions along the way and I think that's a great way of saying it, guide and counsel. I, I think that some people are under the misapprehension that um, an agent or an editor might change the work beyond what the way that the author wants it. But the point is actually just to create the best product that has the best chance of success, which is to sell more copies. Is that right? Exactly. And a lot of the proposals that I see and a lot of conferences that I go to, the very first question I ask is, who else has seen this? Yeah. And very often it's, oh, my wife read it or, oh, my husband read it or, oh, I gave it to my daughter who's an English teacher, um, which is great, but not quite what needs to happen. You know, you need to be in a writer's group. You need to have a critique partner. You need to have beta readers. You need to have, you know, a broader feel for the content because a lot of the things that we see from new authors starting out are the same mistakes that a beta reader would have caught or, you know, somebody would have helped them kind of eliminate before it came to us. So then you have a better chance of a yes from an agent or an editor if it's been out a little bit wider um, before it even gets to us, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And um, just before we move on to book proposals, um, I know some, I don't know if I know anybody who's uh, indie only, but I know a lot of hybrid publishers, their agents help with um, foreign rights sales with the self-published book because it's so difficult to do on your own and also can help manage um, uh, film options if that comes up. Absolutely. And audio. There uh, are, you know, sub rights right now, especially you mentioned the industry changing. There's gaming apps oh, right. where they're buying novels and turning it into, you know, the game where the reader gets to decide, you know, which guy she chooses or whatever. There are serialization apps, there's film, there's all kinds of digital formats. Um, Some are free, some are paid. So when an author self-publishes, 
one of my hybrid authors, one of the things I do is we look to mine those subrights, large print for library, audio book, uh, which is huge right now, um, any of the gaming or digital formatting, yeah. uh, foreign, which you mentioned is almost impossible if, if you don't have an agent um, yeah. because of the tariffs you know, because of the currency and the exchange rates, it's a, the contracts are very difficult. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a lot of those kinds of things that we can help the author make money, even if they self-pub. Yeah. And I have to say, just when we start talking about, you know, um, there's probably still contracts that say this, but uh, I remember reading about com contracts that say, you know, this right, this right, this right, and all rights that ever are discovered in perpetuity. And yep. um, Joanna Penn also has a podcast called The Creative Pen. And a couple of times she's mentioned like how funny it is. She's like, for instance, when these um, uh, space exploration companies that have decided they're going to do tourists, uh, of going around the earth and coming back as, as their new tour, um, they will have to discuss the rights that people have regarding um, listening to an audiobook, reading an ebook, or watching a movie because now it is no longer on the earth. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. And publishers do that. I, I have often said this in classes that every contract is created because something happened. You know, all those clauses is because somebody goofed or something happened and they're like oh now we need an addendum or now we need a clause that addresses this so that's why they try to grab and and make it as all-inclusive <laughs> sometimes as possible but you're right I mean who, what movies are going to be shown on the space shuttles or whatever going <laughs> right. back and forth and are those rights you know licensing things already kind of taken care of or is that going to be new stuff that has to be discussed yeah you're exactly right yep. yeah yeah Okay, so now people are thinking, all right, I, I have a better understanding of this big picture. So how do book proposals come into the picture? So a book proposal is huge. And I always tell authors uh, at conferences to start with the subject line. So because of all of the volume of emails that I get, if I, in the subject line, it just says query, I'm like, eh. But if it says, you know, query Harry Potter meets, you know, the Hunger Games or something like that, I'll be like, oh, that's interesting, you know, yeah. or I opened one recently that was uh, witches in Regency England. And I was like, oh, that's kind of, you know what I mean? So the subject yeah. line um, is kind of your first impression for an agent. And so a lot of folks don't put a lot of thought in that, but that really is kind of the first point of contact with an agent or an editor. So I would, I even suggest that. And then we hear a lot about query letters, proposals, submission packages, you know, what is all of this? So yeah. query letter typically is that first letter, that one pager that says who the person is, what their project is, word count, which is huge. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of my no's are because it's, outside a normal range of word count, either too little or too big. Right. Um, genre, which a lot of authors don't even know what genre they're writing in. And so that kind of tells me how much on their game, you know, they are, if they say it's 250,000 words and it's historical fantasy, romantic suspense, you know, I'm <laughs> thinking that is not a thing. Yeah. So let's talk about that. And it's a trilogy in one book. So let's talk <laughs> about that. Um, so those are some of the key points that help us filter uh, that query letter, which is the first kind of thing that gives us um, an overview of the project and those key points, word count, genre, maybe even target audience. Um, and then the proposal itself has that all important hook. You hear that all the time, you know, the elevator pitch. Um, and basically it is one sentence that kind of sums up what the project is. Um, we've seen a lot of mashups, like I mentioned about Harry Potter meets Hunger Games or things like that, but it helps give the agent uh, a picture of what this project is going to be or who the audience for this project might be. Um, Can I interrupt with a question? Sure. Okay. So first of all, I also have the, the same kind of, oh, I would read an email where the subject line, Harry Potter meets the Hunger Games. I'm like, what? But 
Okay. So let's just say that person actually did a great job and you, and you read the proposal and you're like, it really is kind of Harry Potter meets the Hunger Games. But then those really aren't related genres. So how does the author choose and give you some idea of, of they really have looked into this, even though maybe they're, you know, not the, certainly not the expert that you are in, in making the, the, the final, you know, this is where that book would sit on a shelf. Right. Thoughts? Well, yeah. Um, and that's part of the counseling. There are several conversations that I have. As a matter of fact, I'm having one with an author to this week or next week where it's historical, but it could go YA or adult because okay. the time period you've got the protagonist in the 18 year old, 16 to 18 year old range, which was adult back then, but would be seen as YA right now. And so there's the discussion of how much peril, um, how much language you know, how much romance, which helps kind of decide then which side we need to go on. And so um, uh, there's not a lot of set in stone with that other than um, knowing, like you said, where it's going to sit on a bookshelf, how it's going to be described in the keywords and on the back cover copy. But it's always open to discussion um, because it may be that once we get into it, oh, this was pitched as middle grade, but really the peril is higher than that. And the, and the people are dealing with issues that are beyond a middle grade level. So we yeah. need to discuss maybe moving this into YA. So there is a lot of that kind of shushing around sometimes to make, sh to get the project where it needs to fit okay, to be so able to sell it. Okay. So in the proposal, like you want to show that you've thought about it and you've tried, but don't get too stressed about that. You're not even sure exactly. You're just going to do your best and then let the agent read it. Exactly. Because that's part of the partnership is really kind of deciding, you know, if they have, if they're on TikTok and their fan base, they're, you know, the people who are following them, their platform are in the 16 to 18, but their protagonists are in the early 20s or maybe somebody's married, then there's a disconnect there. So then maybe we would recommend aging down, you know, the characters to be more um, acceptable or applicable to the readership that they've got, you know, yeah. kind of generated. And so um, we have counseled authors in that way to help them match audience with content and also trends you know okay. right now maybe YA historical is trending so we would want to shift that way to give it a better chance to sell and so it's wonderful to have authors like you said that have an idea but aren't necessarily set in stone and are open maybe to our guidance oh, of, yeah. you know shifting or dodging and weaving a little bit to make right. it work Okay. All right. So you were talking about query letters that got me onto that question yeah. and how query letter fits into the proposal. So I'll let you get back on topic again. Sure. So the query letter is kind of that first email, that first page, because agents usually won't open attachments. Mm -hmm. And so we ask for the Seymour agency does, and I know everyone's different. So my probably biggest piece of advice would be to go to the website and look at the submission guidelines. And I have authors that reference based on your website, here is the query letter and the first five pages pasted within the email, because that is what we ask for. So I know they've at least done their due diligence that way. Yeah. So I recommend authors do not just throw spaghetti at the wall to really research not only the agency, the agent, but also the submission guidelines, because that's also kind of a filter. If yeah. you can't follow directions, you know, or are sloppy, um, then this may be more work than I'm right. willing to put in. Right. So for us, it's the query letter and first five pages. Um, and then I ask for more. And that would be the full proposal then and three chapters. So the proposal would have that hook, the, a brief description or synopsis, um, their bio and headshot. So I can see what previous publishing experience they have, whether it's articles or self-pubbed, um, what affiliations they have potential marketing. I like to see kind of their links because we do research. We'll click on those links. We'll uh -huh. say, okay, I want to see you on Twitter. And if you haven't posted in two years, we're going to have to talk about, you know, being a little bit more relevant. Yeah. Um, so I want to see where they are marketing wise and potential endorsers. 
you know, how engaged are you in the writing community? Who do you know? Are you part of those writers groups? You know, are you engaging with other authors and readers online and, yeah. and nurturing those relationships? Because I'm thinking that's going to help with sell through. That's going to help with positioning and marketing when we have a book. Yeah. Um, so those are the things that I look for in the proposal and then first three chapters. Excellent. And um, it's uh, for some, pe- some people, um, you know, what? I remember being in that place where I so much wanted to do everything right to get like the best possible chance. And then I would be asking questions like, you know, single space or double space and how many pages should a chapter be and stuff like that. In general, what's your what's your advice to people to help them to relax and just like put their best foot forward at the same time? It's hard to do both. (laughs) That's a great question. And, you know, some agents get really stuck on formatting you know, but you'll see a lot of smaller publishers to do that. Like you have to send it in 12 point, you know, times Roman and double spaced, and that's their filter. You know, that's their way of seeing if you can follow directions. I'm not as much a stickler on that. Uh, I'm more about the content, but spelling, if they spell my name wrong, or there's a lot of typos or grammatical errors, it hasn't, I mean, it's almost like a job interview. You know, this is what you're giving me you know, and it hasn't been thoroughly proofed. And so that kind of talk speaks to work ethic, you know, and um, attention to detail. So for me, it's more that than it is. But I think 12 point times Roman, you know, (laughs) the proposal double spaced. And then I like my chapters, either single spaced or double spaced. A lot of submission guidelines will dictate. So again, doing that research will help pave the way to more guesses, I think, than no's. This is interesting because one of the things that people will find as they start working with an editor in in whatever uh, way that they're doing it with um, somebody at a traditional house or somebody they've hired on their own, part of what uh, you have to learn is that, yes, this is your story, but now you're working in partnership with someone else to make it a better story. And when somebody says, this isn't working, maybe try this, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do this this way. It means there's an issue here and I need you to figure out a way to fix the issue. Sometimes that's what it means. Um, And I'm thinking, this is very interesting because the way that you've described at least how you and many others um, will look at uh, whether or not somebody followed the rules is, is this somebody who listens and pays attention and is willing to be part of, you know, a team where, you have some things that you need and you need to see whether or not they're willing to do this very small step of reading the submission guidelines and following them, because it may say to you, um, I don't know that this person will be very easy to work with if they can't even do this one small thing at the beginning is, am I kind of hitting that right? You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And it's, it's just like, like when I'm at conferences and people come late you know, or they're in sweats and their hair is wet. And I'm thinking, you know, this is kind of like that job interview. Are we going to be a good team? Are we going to be a good partner? And if, you know, I'm here on time, you know, waiting and this is what you show me. So do you not care? Um, And I think all of those things kind of weigh into because for an agent, we're looking for long-term relationship. And so, um, not just do I like you personally, but are we going to work together really well? And do you respect me? Do you trust me? I need to respect you. I'm going to trust you. And we're both going to put as much effort into this as humanly possible to get the best project possible so that we can sell it and get it out there and sell as many copies as possible. So if there's that kind of laissez-faire attitude at the beginning, it makes me think maybe their heart isn't into it. Maybe they're already burned out. Maybe they're distracted. Maybe this was a bet, you know, that, oh, I'd have a novel published by the time I'm 50. You know, I mean, what's the motivation here? Are they really (laughs) not serious about it? And so we're not judging. We're just seeing that maybe the, uh, the seriousness, you know, the level of commitment and professionalism isn't quite there yet. Yeah. 
All right. This is very helpful, I'm sure, to people. It's also helpful to me being somebody who's interested in being hybrid. And it has been so long since I've been in a position to talk to an agent or editor in a potentially um, business situation. The nice thing is, is that I'm no longer scared of that conversation. <laughs> but um, but you, you start thinking about all the stories that you've heard and you're like, okay, so what's the real story? Part of the real story I'm pretty sure you're saying is that it really does depend a little bit on the agent and the editor and what each person's personality is. Maybe is there a personality to an agency as well? That's a great question. I think so because the agents that I know that are friends, each agency has a different flavor to it, almost like a different restaurant. You know, are you going for the food? Are you going for the service? Are you going for the prices? You know, are you going for the ambiance? Agencies are very much that way. Uh, The Seymour agency, I feel like we bend over backwards on customer service. I don't know that you would find a lot of agents that help with the marketing like we do. You know, I I don't know that you would have as many agents maybe aggressive in film and foreign rights as we are. And so I think for an author, it's important when shopping for an agent to figure out what's important to them. Do you want to see you know, weekly communication, weekly reports, um, you know, uh, constant communication with your agent. Uh, Do you expect to be big five only? Mm -hmm. You know, are you okay with, you know, mid-list publishers getting your expectations and kind of your wish list in place first and then matching it to the agency and agent is important because I tell folks, I hate spreadsheets. (laughs) I will tell you who I submitted to, but if you want daily updates and all that, that is not me. (laughs) Um, So uh, let's find a different way, you know, to touch base and communicate. And I tell my authors when they email me to text so that the emails don't get lost. So communication differences. You know, I hear horror stories. I think we all have about authors who never hear from their agent. You know, it's been six months. The only time they hear is when it's time to sign a new contract. Um, That is not who we are. If you're okay with that, you know, that's great. Then make sure you know that going in to the relationship. So you're exactly right. Getting those expectations and your, uh, how I'm going to need things I'm going to need to be successful as an author and then find an agent and an agency that can provide that for you. That is brilliant. I feel like we should just, if this were in print, I would highlight it and make it like (laughs) a bullet on the side. So let's just say that again. If now I'm like, well, what exactly did you say? But it was brilliant. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Don't ask me to repeat it. I I was like, I would, as an author, I would write down your expectations. Yes. Write right, down your goals. Yeah. Do you need to be communicated with? Do you need FaceTime? You know, what kind of reporting is important to you? Yeah. Uh, trust. Do you trust that even in the quiet time when you're out on submission that I'm still working for you and that things are happening? You know, do you want to be big five or is, you know, mid list okay? Because yeah. when we get together and talk about pitching, that's important. Yeah. Right. And I can't guarantee big five. So if that's important to you, maybe you need a bigger something, you know, somebody maybe with a bigger track record there. I don't know. Uh, If film is important, you're going to find an agency that has a high success rate in in placing books to film Uh, foreign rights. You know, what's important to you as an author and then find that agent and that agency that matches it. And also personality wise, like um, some people would consider a bulldog. If somebody uh, described themselves as a bulldog kind of agent, some people would be like, yeah, that's what I want. And other people would be like, I totally don't want that. That sounds scary. (laughs) I need somebody who will pat me on the back and tell me I'm doing a good job. (laughs) You're exactly right. I have a drawer with notes that say that I was so encouraging. And I feel like that's Uh me. I'm more of the cheerleader you can do it, you know, and, and let's keep working. And, um, I hate contracts. It's part of the job. That's not the fun part for me. I'm more about the content development and the marketing. That middle part to me is kind of a necessary evil. So if you're wanting an agent that is going to tear apart contracts and, and eke out, you know, from 14 to 15%, you know, royalty, um, we do that, but that's not where my passion lies. Um, yeah. I'm more on the front end, the con- content development and on the back end for the marketing. Nice. 
great. Okay. This is great information. Now, um, if, if, a uh, author has recently finished, um, maybe a, a brand new style of book or their first book, uh, I've got people listening who are all across the whole range of, um, I haven't finished one yet to, I've got like 25 or 45 out already, but I like this podcast. Thank you. I love you guys both. <laughs> um, some people, uh, are writing, oh, let me give you an example. My friend Paula, she's been working for uh, Harlequin's Desire line for a very, very, very long time. But in her heart, she really wants to do the space opera trilogy. Paula, if I got that wrong, I apologize, but I'm pretty sure that that's it. She's not going to sell space opera anything to Harlequin, not any other line of Harlequin. It's just not going to happen. Not even Myra, I don't think. <laughs> so, so let's say somebody's working on something that's really new and different from them. Um, I have a guess that one of the things that they might need to do is um, either write the book of their heart and, and just be happy with it and then try to figure out, this is a question in the end, <laughs> and then try to figure out, you know, is this the kind of book that I send to Tor or Grand Central or Ravel um, versus getting to the total finished product end? You've done tons of edits. It's well-developed. Um, and now you have to figure out at the end what kind of publishing house that you're looking at. Do you have an opinion as an agent talking to authors at, you know, conferences and all sorts of things, probably talking to your own authors when they have some sort of passion project, something's different. Uh, where do you suggest that they start looking at um, who is this going to go towards? That is a great question. Uh, one of the things that could be part of the proposal is comparables comparable titles. And so that um, lets me know that you've been doing research in this genre, you've been doing research in this age group, you've been doing research in this audience realm, and you've given me comparable titles. They may, and, and some of the good proposals that I see say it's like this, it's like Hunger Games, I'll just keep using that. And it's, you know, Hunger Games could be a comparable, we call that a super comp because it's just so big and well known, but it's my book is like this because, and my book is different because. And so as an agent, it helps me think about which editors I would pitch it to. So if it's science fiction is very narrow focused, uh, the target audience there, I mean, you can't, it, it's so rapid, the science fiction audience, you know, almost anything that's sci-fi they're gonna consume but there's not that many publishers doing science fiction. So if your comparables are science fiction titles, that may give me pause. I may not know any editors looking for science fiction right now. Um, so maybe we need to pivot and talk about spec or fantasy, you know, as maybe an entree for this book. Can we position it maybe differently? So I would say write the book of your heart and let the agent help you decide kind of where it goes, but comparables do help uh, because that does give us a framework for, for figuring out what the book would be called and where it would sit on a bookshelf and which editors like Tor or, you know, Jollyfish or, you know, HarperCollins or whatever to pitch it to. So it gives us yeah. kind of a head start on where you think this would sit. Um, and then we obviously would discuss kind of beyond that. Excellent. And, and hopefully um, everybody listening, you already have an idea that you should probably have at least a vague idea of the kind of genre that you're in. So for instance, you wouldn't pitch space opera to Ravel because they publish Christian fiction. Uh, so, and you wouldn't publish, um, I, I would, you know what, I'm not going to say no to the Harry Potter meets Hunger Games pitch towards Tor. I guess it just depends on how the book was written, right? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Okay, good. This is good though. I mean, the whole point is if I'm reading you right, you want people to have thought this through at least to the best of their ability. And then if you end up um, me meeting with them and you two decide this is a great relationship, we should formalize it. And now you're their agent, then you work together and you figure it all out. Exactly. That's part of that dodging and weaving, the discussion, the discussion of where this would fit in the marketplace. Yeah. You know, do we need to tweak the age 
of the characters? Do we need to maybe change the setting? Do we need to add in maybe magical realism because urban fantasy, you know, maybe is on the downslope right now, you know, yeah. those kinds of discussions. Cause we're on the phone all the time with editors talking about their wish lists and we watch trends. Of course you can't write to trends, yeah. but it gives us kind of a starting point for trying yeah. to pitch. And to your point, so when I sit down with an author and I ask them, has anyone seen this before? You know, other than a spouse or, or a child. Another question I ask is, do you read in this genre? Because I've had publishers tell me that they get stuff pitched to them that's YA that is clearly middle grade and that there's different nuances, there's different voices, and that that helps them to realize that the author is writing in a void and not reading what they write. And so that's important. Um, Liz Pelletier with Entangled, she says that like middle graders... They all work as a group. There's a pack of them and they all talk constantly. They share feelings. They vet ideas. They're, you know, if you think stranger things, right, there's that group of kids and they're talking. YA, they don't. YA are very introspective. There's maybe one or two close friends. Uh, They don't share a lot of details. It's more kept inside. Yeah. And so if you pitch something as a YA that has a group that's talking incessantly, the editor is going to know you really have miscategorized your project. And so then my question is, do you read in that genre? Because yeah. you'll realize that this won't work for YA. Right, right. Oh, that's brilliant. Wow. I want people to just like always be taking notes. I get these great guests like you that are giving such amazing information. Now we don't have a ton of time left, but I wanted to ask you, uh, I have two more questions on my list and I'll let you decide how much time you want to spend on them. Um, One is the difference between a fiction and a nonfiction proposal. And one is simultaneous submissions. Excellent question. So Uh, For a fiction proposal, like I mentioned before, it used to be that we would take it with just three chapters. I'm going to ask you, is the is the novel complete? I want to know word count. I want to know genre. I want to know that it's complete because I'm probably not going to sign you if it's not. Uh, I need to be able to evaluate the entire project because editors are going to want to see the entire project. Um, So those those key elements are huge for fiction. For nonfiction, it's more about the table of contents. And I pitch nonfiction incomplete because the table of contents already lets me know what's coming. Um, Also, endorsers for nonfiction are more important Uh than for fiction because we need street cred. We need that third party endorsement that this person who's speaking about finance or parenting or sex education or whatever the topic is, has knowledge. And we need other people from those fields to say this person knows what they're talking about, that the information you're gonna get here in nonfiction form is accurate and applicable and appropriate. Uh, The exception to that would be memoir, obviously, because that's the person's own story and you don't need anybody to verify that it's, (laughs) you know, authentic, Um, but, so yeah, that's, those are kind of the key differences between the fiction and nonfiction and both platform is equally important. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, we can pitch nonfiction partial, whereas with fiction, I need to see the full. And because the nonfiction is the proposal is being judged a lot on uh, the chapter titles, you actually want descriptive chapter titles rather than cute chapter titles. Yeah, correct. Like a sentence that tells us what we're going to find within that chapter to show kind of the broad scope of what's going to be covered topic wise within that nonfiction book. Nice, beautiful. Okay. And then what are your thoughts on simultaneous submissions? And you can talk about it from the agent and the editor perspective, wherever you think is, is the right way to look at it. It makes sense to go out on simultaneous submission. I know that um, that just makes sense that you're, you know, timing wise, you're not going to wait for my response before you go out to someone else. I think that research of, you know, I get a lot of dear agent 
letters, oh, yeah. which let me know that they haven't chosen me. They're just kind of casting a wide net. And so I'm less inclined to take the time. Um, I, I get a lot of great proposal query letters that say, you know, I saw you tweet that you want this, or I saw, you know, your author, this and mine would be similar to make that personal connection. But simul I want them to say this is simultaneous submission. Yeah. Um, I had a call last week with an author, made an offer for representation. She said, I'll get back to you after Thanksgiving. So I said, are you talking to other agents then? Because I, I kind of want to know, yeah, you know, where we are in the process. So I'm not going to start reading, thinking it's a done deal, right? start working on her project then because she's still kind of courting yeah. others. Um, and there have been instances where we're reading the full and get an email saying, Hey, I've just signed with somebody else. Oh, and that's wow. frustrating. Yeah. Um, because reading 400 page manuscript, you know, obviously takes a lot of time. So I think it's just that open communication. Hey, Julie, this is simultaneous submission. And then when I request a full, they, they tell me, you know, yeah. and I usually say, if you get other interests, let me know. Yeah. You know, don't just because I'm reading this now, I'd like a <laughs> shot, you know, yeah. at talking to you and um, instead of you just saying, hey, by the way, I've gone with somebody else. Yeah. So it's, it's just almost fair business practice. Right. You know, uh, letting someone know, like the job interview, you know, would you just you would say, hey, I've got this offer from somebody else. You wouldn't just kind of disappear. You know, right. um, it, it's just kind of polite, I guess, yeah. business communication. Yeah, that, yeah. So, so even though, huge. right. So even though um, there are some agents and agencies that have a, a really long, um, I don't even know if lead time is the right time, but um, just a long time that it takes for, for them to get back. If you haven't heard from somebody, but things start moving in another direction, still go ahead and send the email saying, I just wanted you to know you've got my proposal, but um, I, I'm also talking to so-and-so or I've exactly. got to more people. Exactly. And right. believe it or not, there are agents who won't look until you get to that point. Oh. There's even e there's editors that do that. A friend of mine from Simon and Schuster's children, because we if we get an offer, we usually go back out to the other editors and say, hey, we have an offer. Same yeah. kind of thing. And we give them an opportunity to kind of step up to the plate. And it's only then that things bubble up in his queue and he takes a look. It's that I'm afraid of missing out on that. You know, so if somebody awesome. else wants it, heck no, I'm taking it kind of thing. Um, it's but it's, funny it's just because. You're talking about YA just a minute ago, and I'm thinking, well, this is a little bit like high school. Wait, if everybody wants to date her, then so do I. <laughs> exactly. And no, you're not getting that. I want that. <laughs> so it's uh, it's competitive. Yeah. Um, but I think all problems and all bad feelings and all bad juju and vibes can be avoided just through clear, open communication. That's brilliant. You know, so because uh, I want to know. Yeah. Um, because then I'll hurry you know, yeah, and, yeah. and get back to you quicker as opposed to just being uh, left out or, or not having an opportunity yeah. to be a part of a project. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, as much as you and I were saying, we could talk all week about Absolutely. writing related. Um, we probably should stop. So um, let's, a couple of things that I just want to um, uh, have you mention in the end is uh, definitely where people can find you online and where all should they look? Because some people are looking on a couple of different websites to find out what authors are, are sorry, what uh, agents are interested in. And then feel free to, to mention um, maybe some some of the um, virtual conferences that you're involved in so people can maybe just sort of get to know you a little bit more from a shyer distance or uh, where they can find out what sorts of things that you're looking for, um, how people, when people should get a hold of you. Yeah. Great. So our uh, website is the seymouragency.com. And on there, you'll see all of the agents profiles and, um, there's a little bit of a wish list, kind of what we represent, what we don't represent. Like I don't do erotica, you know, and I really don't do devotionals and not so keen on memoirs. They're just harder unless you've been kidnapped by Somali pirates and, you know, survived there. It's, it's a tougher sell, um, yeah. but you can kind of look through there. Tina Wainscott does um, like spiritual, but not Christian. 
And so uh-huh. she'll say that, you know, she's, she's the, the yoga and the different kinds of religions. Whereas if my, you know, so she said, if it's Christian, go to Julie. So reading those bios, that's part of that, doing that research on the front end that I think is so important. And then we have our individual emails there. Um, I'm also on query manager and I'm also on MSWL, a manuscript wish list. Wish list. Okay. Yeah, and, and editors are usually on there too. But I also encourage folks to follow me on social media. I'm very open uh, about what I'm looking for. I'm always posting about books and trends and tips and things like that. Um, and I've had people DM me through social media, which isn't my favorite form of communication, but I, yeah. I will try to respond. Um, that's more for me kind of outgoing stuff as opposed to uh, in. Um, and then my email you know, is, is always available. It's Julie at the Seymour agency.com. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you so much. This is just so much information. I'm so excited. You gave us a whole lot of stuff that uh, we haven't heard before on the show. So yay. (laughs) Good. Good. I'm glad. (laughs) Well, listen, thank you so much. I know that, you know, everybody has a busy day, but it seems like I don't know a single agent or editor who doesn't have a very busy day every day. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. I have had so much fun, Kitty. I really have. And just to your authors, I want to say you can do this, but in chair, finish that project and then query because that's, that's all it takes. 